And would you please now give a warm Fresno, San Joaquin Valley, and State of California welcome to Mr. Carl Bernstein. Uh, it's great to be here, no matter how late I arrived last night, no matter how long the baggage at your airport takes. <laughs> Pretty extraordinary, actually. <laughs> Everybody has been really lovely and kind. Most of all, the merit scholars that I just met with, who are so enthused about where they're going. And so I, I'm going to, maybe even though there are a thousand or twelve hundred uh, of the rest of you out here, I'm going to also talk a little bit more directly to them, uh, but I hope it'll be good for all of us, uh, and it's intended for all of us, but, but they're much more in my thoughts uh, than when, before I met them a few minutes ago. Let me begin by saying how lucky I've been, because I discovered at a very young age, their age. What I love to do, and what I still do today, and I'm still loving it and learning from it. Last night, after I'd made some notes for this talk, I began thinking about that time of my life in Washington half a century ago, more than half a century actually, where I was born and raised in Washington, about what's happening in Washington today and trying hard not to mythologize about the past. After all, I grew up in Jim Crow, Washington, a racially segregated capital of the United States, almost 100 years after the Civil War. I went to segregated public schools in Washington, D.C., until the Supreme Court decided in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 when I was in the sixth grade and for the first time come that September, our schools were integrated. And in the next decade, our country was transformed by the civil rights revolution that began with that decision in Brown versus Board of Education. When I was the same age as several of those students that I just met with, when I was 16 years old, and in my junior year in high school in 1960, I went to work almost full-time for a great Washington newspaper, the Washington Star, the town's afternoon newspaper in those days. The Star no longer exists, but it competed against, and in those days usually out-reported, the Washington Post, where later I spent most of my newspaper career. But really, I, I grew up and was educated in that newsroom at the Star by a wonderful group of people, all of them older than I was, who understood what the press, this calling of reporting and journalism was about, and knew how to have the time of their lives doing what they loved in a collegial environment that teemed with excitement and drama. And looking back on that time, I can assure you that it would never have occurred to me or any serious person I knew in Washington in my youth to ask the question, why isn't our government working and can it? It would never occur to me in 1960 when I went to work that in my lifetime, one of the three branches of the government, the Congress of the United States, would become totally dysfunctional or that money would become the most important element in the mechanics of our political system or that working class people and the middle class in this country, those who in the 1960s provided great opportunities for their children, unheard of in the history of the world, opportunities for me and my schoolmates that might have been a good deal greater than these students, who are going to have to work harder at it than I and my friends had to, because the middle class I could never have imagined then in America would half a century later 
be struggling to stay afloat in the richest country in the history of the world. And again, these wonderful students that I met today, many of them are going to be burdened by student debt. It's going to make it hard to race out of the starting blocks when they graduate. In 1960, when I went to work at the Star as a copy boy, a kind of jack-of-all-trades apprentice in the newsroom, John Kennedy was running for president. And I went to most of his press conferences over the next three years, not to report on it, but to dictate a running text of his words back to the newsroom as Kennedy talked in full, elegant sentences with wit and spontaneity and care for the words and learning. And those words were usually about making our political system work and America's place in the world. I also covered his funeral and burial and the events of the assassination weekend 50 years ago, last November, which today seems to me, after those 50 years now, a good vantage point, a good prism to look back 50 years later at that era, not with nostalgia, there were plenty of failures and fits and starts, but with realism about a country and a political system and a judiciary and a Supreme Court that dealt thoughtfully with the problems and opportunities of America, almost always considering above all else, no matter how fractious the debate, the national interest and looking for practical solutions to benefit the common good. And let me parenthetically add here that I'm now reading a great book about what happened 50 years ago this week, a book by Todd Purdom about the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I hope that some of you, especially the students here, will read that book. I was also at John Kennedy's inaugural in 1960, interviewing people in the crowd my first days at the paper, as the cadences and meaning of his words electrified those who heard them there and on the radio and television. And the question that he asked that day, after he had taken his oath of office, standing at the west front of the Capitol building, that question still resonates, but also perhaps cast a shaming shadow on today's era in Washington. And maybe even too, on too much of our citizenry, a shaming shadow, and our journalism, a shaming shadow. John Kennedy challenged America that day, its people, and our political system, and to a remarkable extent, they, the generation of most of the people here, in this audience responded and kept responding after his assassination and through subsequent presidencies and sessions of Congress and generations through the development of America in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. As everyone here probably knows, he said, ask not what your country can do for you. He challenged America that day, but what you can do for your country. Common good as a people something that sounds almost quaint or disingenuous in today's political debate. Since then, in the 50-some years later, it's been my privilege and good luck to report on each succeeding president of the United States, to write books about them and about a great pope of the Catholic Church and about the history of our time and about a woman who may or may not be the next president of the United States and also for more than 40 years to travel around this country, especially between the two coasts, to every state, and to learn about the magnificent people in this nation who are too often forgotten in Washington, both in our politics and our journalism. Even most of it in the media culture today is utterly without context has become wrapped up in this ideological 
scorched earth debate. Facts by themselves are not truth. The most important thing a journalist or a news institution, whether in print or online or on the air, does is to determine what is news. Today, I would suggest, if I were the editor of a great news institution, that there are two overriding interrelated stories. The breakdown of the political system itself in this country, just as we're talking about here today, and how it came to be, and whether it can be fixed, and how it could be fixed, and whether it can be made to work. And the second story, coursing through everything, whether we are going to be a nation of the wealthy, for the wealthy, by the connected, by the wealthy and privileged, at the expense of the great majority of our people.